Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Live at Lunch. My name is Kim Goff. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the territory of the Songhees and Esquimalt Nations, Sons of Lekongan, uh, it's a place to smoke herring. Uh, we are located on this territory, and it's where we're gathered today for our presentation uh, by Dr. Joel Gibson, who's our curator of entomology. Um, most of you have been here before, <laughs> but I'll let you know this is a free noon hour series. Uh, and each presentation lasts around 40 minutes, and then there's time for a Q&A. Today we have Dr. Joel Gibson. Joel has been the curator of entomology at the Royal BC Museum since 2016. After a brief career as a high school teacher, he earned his doctorate degree in entomology and he worked internationally. Here in BC, he explores a variety of habitats and including one very close to where we are now, the native plant garden here at the Royal BC Museum. And he's going to talk to us today about a recent experiment he conducted there. So please welcome Dr. Joel Gibson. Thanks, Jim. And thanks for everybody coming out and chatting. I'm going to keep it light and informal. If anything occurs to you at any point, just stop me and we'll chat about it for a while. But in the meantime, I can tell you about, like Kim said, some interesting stuff I've been doing here at the museum. Um, we are going to acknowledgement, which I always appreciate starting off with. And we're here. As you know where we are, we're in Victoria. Um, I also like to situate it now it's specific. Okay, Victoria, that's fine. We all know we're in Victoria. And we're at the museum. Okay, getting a little closer. And this is also research that is, like Kim said, specifically at the museum. A lot of us here are doing research all over the province, um, some international trips as well. But this was kind of a rare opportunity that I got to do literally research from outside my office. Like looking outside, I can do it right there. Um, not right there, but right here. The native plant garden, which is right in front of the archives building, and kind of there's more extensions of it around the building as well. It's beautiful, it's maintained, it's an important part of the museum. Um, I'm really glad Ken Mar is here because I mean, there's a big thank you at the end, but I'll mention it at the beginning. Ken Mar and Heidi Guest, who are in the botany collection, and a whole bunch of volunteers work very hard to maintain this collection. It's it's an important for a number of reasons. I mean, it's aesthetic, it's beautiful, like people like walking through gardens. It is um, it's aesthetic from the building standpoint. It sort of situates the building in a certain way. And I find it's really important to sort of understand how the building interacts with the rest of the city. It's a nice little break. I mean, it's literally this little hole you can go in and get out of downtown and you're surrounded by these plants. And the fact that it's actually very purposeful that there are native plants. These are carefully selected plants that are maintained, that are there. Um, Ken and, and Heidi, the volunteers, know which plants are where, they know why they're planted there. And it's interesting. And if you want to learn about native plants in the province, this is a good place to go and look at them. So all of these great reasons. Now, active research on it, this doesn't have to be part of it, but it didn't happen to be in one case for me. And the plant I want to start with, now I'm certainly not qualified in any way to go through all the plants in the garden, not a botanist. I wouldn't be able to necessarily identify them or tell you a lot of interesting things about all the plants in the native plant garden. But there was one in particular that I was starting with that I did know about, about help learning how to identify it, and it's Nutka Rose, which is um, definitely native to this area, not just BC, it's actually quite widespread in the West, <clears throat> but it is a rose. Rosa Nutcana is the Latin name. And Alaska to California, east of Montana, New Mexico, that's sort of a rough idea. I don't know exactly which of those habitats it's more in, but I do know you find it around Victoria. Some people plant it. I put some in my yard just because it's beautiful. Nice, big, pink flowers, yellow, stamens in the middle, and anthers. And uh, the leaves are characteristic. So it's a rose. It's a beautiful native rose. Now, this is the part that you use to identify it. You're like, oh, there's the rose. I understand it. A lot of times we might talk about pollinators on it. I'm not going to talk about pollinators today. There's another whole other project that hopefully someday in the future I'll be able to present about what insects are actually visiting rose on Nucana and pollinating them. Are they the same ones that are pollinating non-native roses? Other things that are similar plants. I've started to make observations about Himalayan blackberries versus Nutka roses, which often bloom at the same time but have totally different insects on them. I'm not gonna talk about that today. That's different, you have to come back. 
but <clears throat> a different structure on the rows that I noticed, which led to this whole other thing that Kim was referring to with this other research, which is this big fuzzy balls growing off the side of the rows. Which is weird. These are galls. And you can see here it's kind of growing off the side of the stem. These are almost always somewhere in the stem. It's not off the leaf, it's not part of the flower. Um, and when you look at it, you're like, oh, is that? initially, whenever I would see these, I would think, oh, somebody stuck something to the tree, especially it's a rose, there's thorns on it. Maybe it's like a piece of fabric or something else. The bird started to build a nest. What is this? But no, it's actually growing out of the side of the stem. And it looks like roots. Sometimes I think, oh, it's a fungus growing on the side. Nope. It's actually plant tissue entirely. All of this is made out of plant tissue. If you were to cut it out and analyze it, it's all made of the plant itself. It's not some other plant growing, it's not a fungus. It is a gall that is produced from the plant itself. I knew this. I had friends that I would kind of ask that knew about these are called galls, G-A-L-L, -L, galls. And they said, okay, well, what you can do, wait till winter, and the plant kind of dying back anyway, cut these off, Hang on to them and see what happens. Now, I had done this before previously, but this is the first time I'd done it here in the native plant garden. So this past winter, actually about a year ago now, I was doing a summer program. I'm not even sure what it was about, but I happened to notice these when I was in the garden. And I was kind of distracted myself in the middle of a talk with some kids or something, and then remembered to come back and get them later. So then I did the program for the This Week in History, which was on on Czech TV, and I said, oh, that was a good chance for me to talk about it in person, but you only get two minutes. And I was like, okay, this is a gall, let's cut it off. Thank you, whatever. Uh, this, you get to see all the rest of it. So I knew these were here. I knew I was gonna cut them off. I knew I was gonna save them. I didn't know what was gonna happen after that necessarily. I had an idea, but, so these are galls. So I took them, put them in, it is very highly complicated scientific <laughs> equipment, very difficult to do. They are jam jars and a piece of cheesecloth. That's really all you need. Um, doesn't even matter the variety. Some of the big pasta jars, some of the little bon bon jam jars, whatever, whatever you got around, piece of cheesecloth and this. And then just leave it over the winter. This happened to be right next to Kim's desk, so it's great. I get to go down every couple of weeks and say to Kim, anything happened in the jars and report on it. Um, me being a good, you know, scientific person, I made sure I put a note in each of the jars saying what day that I put it in there, where was it from, so I don't come back and forget, like, why did I put these in here again? So each of these have some of the dolls that I clipped off, and you'll see they start to kind of shrivel up. They definitely dry out, they're not attached to a plant anymore, but luckily, I mean, if you could have conditions, if you kept it really wet, they might actually start to rot and mold, and then that's not going to work. But if it stays dry like this relatively, it doesn't even have to really get cold. I mean, I could put these outside and probably have no effect, but putting them inside doesn't speed it up. But what happens is insects come out of the balls. This is the big reveal, that the little ball has insects in. So what I was trying to find out is which insects are coming out of these balls. What are they doing? Why are they unique? Anything like that. And the easiest way to do it, wait and see what comes out. So this is what I do, is put these on the windowsill and wait to see. And quite a few things came up. Like this was only out of one or two balls. And there's what, over a dozen, and these are all very tiny wasps. I didn't put a scale bar on there, but they're all just about a millimeter, millimeter and a half, maybe two millimeters in length. These are tiny little wasps. They have to sort of carefully pick out. I have my little pruder that I can suck them out or grab them with tweezers and then pin them. Those are glued to the side of a very tiny little sewing pin basically and that's how we prepare insects you just glue them to the side of it and then you look at them under the scope so that gives you the sense of what comes out of one gall and you're like what are those things and what are they doing and then for that matter what is a gall well other question most of them and i'll go through these there's actually a couple different types you may not notice there but these aren't all exactly the same some of them have a bit longer antenna than others. Some of them have a bit longer, skinnier body. Some of them have a shorter, wider body. There are a couple of different ones. And by the way, if you look at it and you're like, eh, those look different. That's exactly what we do to identify insects. We would look at this and say, roughly, how many species does it look like? And that's your initial guess. That's my number of species guess. Then you look under the scope and confirm it. So if you look and think there's two or three different types, you're right. 
There are two to three different types. The most abundant one, and this is the one that I knew I was going to expect, uh, this is in the family Sinipidae, which are known as gall wasps. They are all gall forming wasps. Um, and these are the most abundant. They do have kind of longish antenna, they have kind of a wide abdomen here, and then this long spiky. Now, that might not be unusual when you think about wasps. Wasps sting. And ants are related to wasps, and some ants will sting. And bees are related to wasps, and bees sting. So a lot of groups in the bees and wasps have a stinger that should come as no surprise to anyone. Except the fact that these ones don't sting animals, they don't attack animals, they don't even interact with any other animals, they only interact with plants. And in fact, this group, which is Diplolepis, which is the genus of them, it only interacts with roses. They are specifically rose wasps. And I knew this, but one of the people I talked to was a professor that I worked with back in Ontario, Joe Shorthouse, and, and he's done years and years of studies specifically on Diplolepis. So he knows about rose, specifically rose gall wasps all around North America. So I asked him and one of his follow-up students, Miles Jang, kind of, I got some tips on how to do this. This was not all my brilliant idea. The best part about science is asking other people for help on how to do things, and they help you. Wonderful. So this is Diplolepis rose, which they helped me to identify it. This was most of the wasps that came out of it. Um, three to four millimeters in length, so they're very tiny. Uh, most of them are females. The females have the little stinger on there. Uh, in fact, we almost never get a male. And if you look at this across the world, when people have collections of these, less than 1% of things in any collections are ever made. There's, in a lot of places, you'll never find a male at all. Um, because they can be parthenogenetic, which means they can lay eggs without mating. They will lay eggs that will develop into more females, and they just will never mate. And you can have generation after generation of this where there's just never any males produced, and they'll just keep reproducing. So these, they have been males. There are species they've never found males at all. They're kind of wondering whether there are certain species that even have any. So this is an interesting example. You almost always get females in. Um, the interesting thing is when you look in the literature, this species, Diplolepis rosae, is listed on Arvensis Pinkinia, two different species of roses. It doesn't specifically say Nucana is a host. So that leaves you with the sort of question, and this is the part that I don't know yet. Does that mean this isn't actually that species of wasp? Maybe it's slightly different and I can't tell the difference. Is this a new record that it is on Rosa Nucana and people didn't know that before? And that's an important thing to report and say, by the way, this one also attacks Rosa Nucana out here in the West Coast. <laughs> because, as is the case, if this wasp is mostly only studied in the East, people would never ask about Nucana because Nucca roses don't grow in the East. So, one of those things that regionally you have to know about something. The way it's important that even all these observations are like, oh, people know this. We're like, well, they may not know it for BC, they may not know it for Vancouver Island. And that extra data point might actually be significantly different. So what this does, and you know, having read up more about this, cynipids specifically, the whole family of wasps, are interesting because they'll take that little stinger, plant it into a plant tissue, and then it's this very, very interesting process that it sort of changes the genetics of the plant causes the plant to grow all of these tissues around where they laid the egg. And they'll start to develop things that shouldn't be there. There will be leaf tissue, root tissue, stem tissue that will form this gall that has layers of other types of plant tissue that should not be growing out inside of the stem. But it is all the plant growing in itself. So it's this weird way to get around the immune system of the plant as well is that it's not the egg that forms this cocoon. The plant fam forms its own cocoon, so the plant's not going to have resistance to its own issues. So it is, the, and you've looked at different groups of wasps, and they'll have all of these very bizarre structures that they'll be able to form. And they can even have multiple different chambers. You can have more than one egg, and they'll all trigger the plant to do the same thing, so they'll kind of share a gall, because it, it might have been one of your questions is, wait a minute, how'd you get a dozen of them to come out of one gall? There's more than one egg in there. So a female can also come and lay an egg in a gall that's already there and be like, oh, here's one that's already started. It's nice because it's protected. You don't get attacked by the plant. You're not going to get eaten by anything else. The larva's not going to get eaten by a bird or something else because 
why is a bird going to start picking apart a piece of rose if it's looking for insects? And it can also provide insulation over the winter. Less of a concern here, we don't often get freezing, but I do know in the east and in places farther north, this is a really important factor. And they realize that these wasps have incredible resilience over the winter because they're very well shielded inside these zones. So the whole work, and this is a whole community, if you ever want to go on, there's gall formers clubs, gall former research groups that are all looking specifically at galls. So I'll get into that a little bit more. But this is the most common one. Certainly not the only one. There's other cyanophids that don't attack roses, not the ones here. Um, this may look like somebody, why are they gluing tennis balls to an oak tree? They're not. Those, once again, are naturally formed out of the side of a stem of an oak tree. Very common, huge groups of them. There's people that, that classify all of these. In fact, there's a lot of people that characterize them by the galls themselves and never even see the wasps. They just know the different types of galls by the shapes, by what type of oak it's on and where on the oak tree it is. Is it leaf? Is it stem? Is it early? Is it late? And then what it looks like. Um, once again, there's like 1,300 species of these. A lot of them on oak trees. Some of them specialize in other things like roses. Many of them parthenogenetic so that they don't reproduce with males. Um, another interesting one, I just was curious once again, looking at oak galls and sometimes called oak apples, although I really don't think anyone could ever eat them. I think it's mostly just that they look like apples. But because they're incredibly hard. But what you can do with these oak apples when you take them off, and this has been known for thousands of years, and in different parts of the world all have versions of this, is pulling off the oak apples, letting them dry, waiting, crushing them up, soak them in water, throw in a rusty nail, or put it in a, in a rusty iron pot, and it forms ink. And then it forms ink, like, and it's almost exactly like ink you use. Like it's permanent, it can be acid free if you don't put any vinegar in it. And it is this high quality permanent ink, including things like the Declaration of Independence was written with oak gall ink because that was just the ink people made at the time. So it's an interesting idea of this wasps interacting with plants, interacting with people writing down. So, all these things I was learning just as I was. Now, it wasn't just snippets that came out of it. Like we said, there was some kind of longer ones, skinnier ones. And these are two of the other ones that came out. These aren't actually photographs of them. I found better photographs on them and acknowledge the people. <clears throat> but two of them that we found, Orthopelma is one. It's an ichneumonid wasp. And Eupelmus is another one, which is a eupelmid wasp. Many of these things don't have common names. They just have sort of Latin names, and they're all and the little tiny wasps, because they're tiny, three to four millimeters in length. Um, I don't know which species the ones that came out. They, they may or may not be identified. I don't know. There's also not a lot of experts in the world to ask. So these kind of get left as uncertain for me right now. But what I do know is both of these wasps are parasites. So they're parasites of not of the rose, but of the cynipid wasps. So they will see a gall. They can go along once again, long ovipositor stinger. This one does too, it's a large one. Uh, will go along, find the gall, and then lay an egg inside the larva inside the gall. And then, so that's why when you take one of these galls and put it on there, you don't know which one's gonna come out because you don't know, is it the original rose wasp or is it something that parasitized it later? And there's no way to know. Because all you know is there's something that formed that gall. And every once in a while you get a gall that's got nothing because something killed what was inside of it and now nothing hatches out. So don't feel bad if you ever do this and nothing comes out. It's not you. It was just in a gall. But it could be one of these two parasites, which is interesting because then you get this whole community of things that are able to recognize the galls on plants, knowing if there's something in it. And the question is, are they really specific? Will they only attack one type of wasp and one type of gall? Could they be a generalist and they'll attack any type of gall, one on an oak tree, one on a rose tree, doesn't matter as long as it's a gall. That is uncertain too. We don't know how specific any of these things might be. And to make it even more complicated, there's also what are called hyperparasites, which is possible with this one. I'm not entirely sure. I'm not sure if people are. It might actually be laying its larva in the larva of this, which is laying the larva in the other one. 
There are some that are only second level parasites that will only lay their eggs in things that have already parasitized something else. And that's called hyperparasitism. Um, and then there's an even more complicated one where you can have kleptoparasitism, where they will lay their egg in the doll, but not eat anything. They'll just sort of steal the house. Um, this happens with birds. You hear about birds that just sort of lay their egg in another nest. And some of the birds will kill the other birds in the nest, but some of them just sit there and just sort of use the space. And it's called kleptoparasitism. Klepto just means steal. So they're just stealing the space. So there are some of these wasps which may not actually be killing other wasps. They're just living in the gulf because it's a good place to live. So this leads to all of these odd questions about when you find the rose, you look and say, well, what's coming out of it? What might be attacking what's coming out of it? And is this an example of a parasite or a hyperparasite or a kleptoparasite? Um, and then there's all these other questions of are these only found in the native plant garden? Are they only in BC? Are they only in the west part of Canada? Um, are they new? Maybe some of these parasites had never been here before and they've just been introduced. And then these other questions, well, wait a minute, is this, are too many galls going to damage the necroses? Well, then maybe if you had more gall wasps, it would result in, you know, if you had more parasites of the gall wasps, then you have less damage to the rose. So should you bring in parasites? And all of these tumbling questions that sort of come out when you think about one can lead to another. And this is the great thing about this sort of observation is you can take it whatever direction that you'd like. If you're interested in preserving the health of neutrosis, you should learn about the galls that affect them. And maybe they don't. Maybe it's like, it doesn't really affect them. They have the weird fuzzy lump in the winter and then it goes away and you don't worry about it. But at some point, and I have seen roses that had so many covering it, like this has to be a problem. Like there's such, and then you go 10 feet away and there's a rose bush with no galls. And I ask, well, why, why didn't the wasps fly over there? But they don't. And then some might have parasites and other ones will have the gall wasp, but no parasites. And that's a whole other level of question that I can't even answer. I can only just pose it out there and walk with um, So this was my observation. It's great. And I want to answer some of these questions, but over time, I'll work with other people. Have you seen them? Let's track it down and see, ask people who know more about the wasps and know more about the roses. So that I can figure out what are these things? Does it matter? Is it just a really interesting data point that I can put in the collection, make available? That's the other great thing about working at a museum. A, we get to do research. We have to work with people. We get to share the things that we learn. Um, you know, give the credit if other people are doing a lot of work. Like we don't necessarily have to take the credit as the museum. It's just who's doing the research. But the other thing is this is available. If we don't get around to it, if I look at this and this is the only thing I ever do, these specimens are still in the collection. They're still labeled, still says, you know, taken from a Nutka rose, reared out on this date, from this location, someone else can come in and do research on these wasps or these roses, because the data is here, and all of our data, we make it publicly available. It's not like the museum owns it. If somebody wants to come in and use those data and do research, that's a really big part of what we do. So I like this, that I can talk about it, do research on it, but if not, somebody can someday too. Now, this is not the only thing that does it, and I thought, I'll throw in a few more things because of the fact, A, I don't even work on wasps. I mostly work on flies. I didn't even mention flies at all yet today, which is probably <laughs> the longest I've ever gone into a talk without ever talking about flies. So we'll get back to some. Plus the fact that actually wasps are not the, well, I don't know most important, but not the most abundant gall formers that you'll find. Probably the most abundant would be Cessidomyia flies. And this is one that almost no one ever sees. They're super tiny, they're super fragile. They're smaller and more fragile than any mosquito you ever saw. Um, if you drove through a cloud of them in your car, you probably wouldn't even notice. They're the ones that snuck on your windshield and don't even form a little smear. They're just really tiny. And the only time these are collected is if people go out into a place and, and sweep up huge amounts and sift through it and realize there's these super tiny little flies. And they have these long, delicate antenna, long, delicate legs, but they exclusively develop inside of galls as well. So a very similar lifestyle that they'll lay an egg into a plant tissue, forms a little gall. They're not as complicated as the gall wasps. They tend to get more research just because the galls themselves are so cool. These are simple little galls, but super abundant. If you ever find leaves, you'll find all these little warts on them. 
those are usually set to the mic and they'll be in huge numbers. You'll see a tree that just gets hit and covered with all of these little warts. And they're usually that. Um, the interesting thing about sets of the mites, I, I worked with, with one guy who works on this family and knows that everyone has a hard time working with them because they're so tiny and delicate. He said, yeah, but if you ever looked at them, it's always different species. And his theory was that every plant species in the world has at least two or three different sets of the mites that'll form, because he's like, every plant you look at has a couple of different versions of a leaf gall and then some other gall, some of them might be like right down at the base of the plant near the roots on the stems. So his theory was every plant in the world had at least two species of gall of cessidomite wasps. So his estimation was 16,000 species in Canada and possibly a million different species of these worldwide, except no one's ever reared them out of the galls and no one's ever identified. Other people have said, Philippe, I think you might be overestimating a little bit, but nobody questions the fact there's tons and tons of species of these things and no one's ever seen them because nobody rears them out of the ball. And they're really hard to identify and look at. So it's tough. Um, other ones you might see, these ones sort of look like that, but these are, sort of, I don't even know what to call these. I remember when I was a kid, I'd be at like my grandma's farm and you'd find all the little red pimples on them. I don't know what else to call them. They're like these little fingery warts. Those are usually mites. They can attack plants in pretty large numbers. Now, this is even tougher. Like you see, I don't even have a picture of the mite. The mites are super tiny because inside of this, you'll have a whole colony of these mites living inside of this little tissue they'll form to sort of cause the plant to develop this. And it's sort of a way to sequester it. It sort of pushes the mites away from the plant. But if you get enough of them, it will damage a tree. If you have leaves that are all covered. Um, this, there's not as many of them, but once again, super tiny. Not a lot of people study these mites because they're very tiny. And then if there's not mites and there's not galls, you can also get this. And you may have seen these before where it almost looks like somebody's gone along and scratched on leaves. Who would go along and like put liquid paper on a leaf? Or who would start to scratch their name and start to look and be like, is that someone's initials? And no, it's none of those things. This is mines, little mines that are in the leaves of a plant. And I picked this one specifically because this is Arbutus. Okay? Yeah. And so common plants around here, and almost every plant around here, you'll find this, and they're mines. And these are something different. In this case, it is a moth that will lay an egg, have super tiny caterpillars, way tinier than you'll see. The caterpillar actually lives between the top and bottom layer of the leaf. Won't break the surface on either side, but will just eat everything in between, which is a very interesting way to live. So they're exactly that big. They will crawl around and sort of do this whole pattern. I find it interesting because it's an odd case where you're like, it better be a big enough leaf. Because what happens when you run out of leaf? They can't go anywhere else. They can't fly. They can't jump to another leaf. So you're kind of hoping your mom picked a big enough leaf for you to develop on. Because if not, you run out. Um, but these are very well known. There's a couple of different groups of moths that do this. The moths are all very tiny, brown, fuzzy moths like this. Not the big ones you see flying around at your life. These will come to lights at night. But once again, they're super small. You probably won't notice them. But you will notice them if they hit your arbutus tree up front. But I always find it's interesting. It's never a case of like the whole tree is covered with these. There'll be a couple of branches here or there, and then there'll be large patches where there's no mines and more. I don't understand why that is. I don't understand the spatial work of these, but I do know that these are often very easy to identify. Even the fact that you just post a picture of a leaf with a mine on it, there's usually someone pretty quickly that can tell you what it is based on the species of the plant and the shape of the mine. Different species of moths will have different shapes. So if you look at that, this one tends to be more straight up and down and kind of reddish. And people are like, oh, no, no, that's an epicule. That's a different kind of moth. And they'll be able to identify it very quickly. So even this, like I was able to Google these pictures, and they just said nepticulid mine, mine, and you'll find it. So these are often identified. Is this about 800 species? Uh, one of the interesting things about this is they've actually found fossils. If you're able to identify them from the pattern on the leaf, if you had a fossil that had the pattern on the leaf, then you have a fossil of the plant and a fossil of the moth. So they're able to have records from 97 million years ago of both the moth and the plant 
and the fact that the plant ate the moth that long ago. So that's kind of another interesting level of it. And they've started to do this with other things, looking at plant damage and trying to identify what that tells you about the insects or the animals eating the plant based on the fossil of the plant. And one more fly, because I really like flies. And this is a particularly interesting one, kind of bringing it back to something else I was talking about, holly, which is pretty, but can be a bit of a problem around here if it gets out of hand. And a lot of attempts to try to control holly because it's one place where there's too much of it. It's not native to the area. But there is a fly. This is an agromycin fly. There's about 2,500 species of those flies. Most of them will also form mites. So almost exactly the same thing as the moth is doing, except they're flies. So they'll do the same thing, burrowing through the leaves. And this is Phytomyza illicit, which illicit means holly. So this is the holly leaf miner fly. So interesting to see that you do find this around here. We've collected a bunch of these, they're in the collection. We're like, well, either somebody brought them in and they started attacking the holly that has been introduced here, or they just found their way here because there was holly here. Um, but people have talked about, would this be a way to control holly? If you had enough of these, would they eat so much holly? And it's unlikely to be a really effective control because they just don't do that much damage. And it would be way too slow. So it's been pitched, but it's interesting, the idea that you could use a fly to control plants. Um, but miners and gulls are probably not the ones. You want something that eats large amounts of plants quickly. So that's why they usually go with things like beetles that will just consume plants or big caterpillars that eat huge amounts of plants. So that's usually when they use it for plant control with insects, not with really. bees. So I do want to say thank you a little early, but I'll take some questions. And especially a thank you to the fact that we have this native plant garden. And thanks to Ken and Heidi and all the native plant volunteers, plant garden volunteers, that we are able to do this. And the fact that we kind of work in a place that, yeah, you can do research, come and talk to people, you can follow up on it. Uh, we're very thankful that that's a big part 